My career has been counterintuitive. I live in Washington, D.C., and not in New York. When I was 24, I started a theater company that did not produce my plays, um, <laughs> but we produced the plays of young people. We taught playwriting in the public schools. We're called Young Playwrights Theater. I write musicals for children. I write comedies and dramas. I am a mother of three, and I have a minivan. Um, <laughs> I would love to have my work be in New York. I would love to end up on Broadway, but I look at the way I've been working and the way my career has been going, and it doesn't seem to be a direct path. And let me tell you why. I am haunted by a monkey. <laughs> and, and it's a true story. And like all true stories, they start even before I was born with my father, um, a six-year-old boy living in Mexico City. Fernando is six years old. He's waiting for his uncle, his Tio Nick, to come because Tio Nick has promised a late birthday president. He's, uh, Tio Nick is the kind of guy that creates excitement. He has shiny black hair. He dances mambo with girls he never intends to marry. Um, <laughs> he's always very, very late you totally know the type. Um, <laughs> suddenly he shows up late and my father runs up to him and says, Tio Nick, Tio Nick, what did you bring me? And Tio Nick is like, oh, I have a monkey with a green tail, all for you. And my little dad, who's not my dad, because he's six, goes, oh, where is it? And Tio Nick points at an airplane up in the sky, he's like, He's on that airplane. He's, it's on his way. And so my dad sits waiting for this green-tailed monkey outside for three days. My grandmother is furious at Tio Nick for making that kind of promise and at my dad for believing in such a full-hearted lie. My dad grows up. He's the first member of our family to become a doctor, and he goes on a scholarship to Denmark to learn about socialized medicine, and he learns and he falls in, socializes with a Danish nurse. Uh, they get married and move to Mexico, and they have me and my little sister. Um, a monkey with a green tail was a kind of phrasing my dad used all the time to describe um, lying to a child, an unfulfilled dream, a dashed hope, and Mexico at that time was filled with unfulfilled hopes. My father uh, was a public health doctor uh, working on sexually transmitted diseases, but the government was not very interested in his progressive ideas of helping the poor or the prostitutes or the disenfranchised. One day he walked into his office and all of the windows had been painted opaque yellow and one of his coworkers was dead by suicide. So soon after, he decided to um, get a scholarship to move to the United States. He would, we would escape the momentary oppression by getting more education, a master's in public health. We left everything behind. Our furniture, our friends, our family, we packed our suitcases and took our dog and took the 3,000 mile trip from Mexico City to Boston. Um, Boston, we saw snow, something we had never seen before, and squirrels. We had only seen squirrels in the zoo, and my sister and I were obsessed with taking pictures <laughs> of squirrels. We moved into an apartment building that was across the street from an old age home for Holocaust survivors, um, hollowed men and women with numbers on their arms, watched us as we moved in, a Mexican man, his Danish wife, and his mixed up children. I waved at one of the old ladies, and she looked through me, past me. It was so strange in this shiny country of the United States to see such a sea of suffering right outside our, right outside our front door. My mom said, the Danes, we resisted the Nazis. Your uncle Aspion, he was put in a concentration camp for his political beliefs. 
When he came back, he was as thin of a, as a skeleton, and he never recovered. The first day of school, I wore braids and a, braids and a pleated Mexican embroidered shirt and a skirt, and all of my classmates wore knockoff Gloria Vanderbilt jeans with a big comb in the back that they used to comb their Farrah Fawcett hair. <laughs> Needless to say, I did not have a great first day of school, or a second, or a third. I was taunted for my accent, for the way I dressed, for the way I went away the world. I would think of responses to say and not be able to come up with them, and I would then go home and write out the dialogue and then get lost in the backstories I invented for my antagonists. <laughs> <laughs> I cried myself to sleep every night and hoped we would move back to Mexico. I felt very alone. Uh, suddenly, it was Halloween. And we started dressing up with gypsy costumes and putting up with a lot of different um, coats, etc. And we wondered when begging for candy would start seeming fun. And then Thanksgiving came, and I told my mom, Mom, Mommy, Mommy, we have to get a, a turkey. But by Thanksgiving Day, my mom hadn't got one, and we went to the supermarket, and the supermarket was closed, McDonald's was closed, and we roamed the empty streets of Boston um, looking for something to eat. We came back home, my mom made us soup, and she promised us that next year we would have a turkey for Thanksgiving. My sister and I looked at each other, what do you mean, next year? My dad says that we had to stay one more year. There was a disease, a disease that was affecting young, strong, healthy men that was killing them, and nobody knew what it was. The US government had asked my Mexican father to stay and help figure that out. One day, my father introduced us to a young man named Patrick. He lived in the apartment building, on the other side of the apartment building. Um, you could tell that Patrick had once had shiny black hair like our Tio Nick, but now he looked more like our Uncle Aspion from a concentration camp. He was young, his, thin, his skin was translucent, he didn't eat, he made jokes. He had been a medical student, but he had to quit. His parents wouldn't see them. They were scared. A lot of people were scared. Uh, suddenly, blood transfusions became ominous. Hemophiliac children were not allowed to go to school. Uh, the caste of dynasty feared for its life. People were scared because people were dying. Not just people, Americans were dying. Actors and artists, drug users, mothers, babies, hemophiliacs, Patrick. Why are they scared of Patrick, I asked my dad. My dad said, they're scared because they're ignorant. It's gonna be my job to help people be less ignorant. And I go, what do you mean a job? I thought you were a student. Well, we're going to move to Atlanta. I'm gonna be part of the Centers for Disease Control. And before we knew it, we had moved everything. And on a sweltering day in Georgia, we were unpacking our boxes and the doorbell rang. And in walks a beautiful woman with big hair holding the hand of a little girl with a ponytail. She brings a casserole of something something with you know, mushroom cream <laughs> soup. <laughs> and she looks at us, she looks past us, through us, at my father's foreign Spanish accent, at my mother's foreign Danish accent, and my sister's and my suspicious lack of accent. And she says, welcome to Hotlanta. What brings you here? AIDS, I said miserably. <laughs> she places the casserole on the table, takes her daughter's hand, and backs out. And I turn on my dad, and I say, papi, 
What are we doing here? This was not the life we were supposed to have. We were supposed to be growing up in Spanish. We were supposed to be close to our grandparents. We are so alone here. I was a kid. I was confused. But the band played on. One day, I came back after school, and I found my dad with his hands, in his head in his hands. And I asked him, what's the matter? And he says, we think we might have found the source of the AIDS virus. And I go, oh, where do you think that is? They say, well, it looks like it might come from an animal. Actually, it looks like it might come from a monkey, the rhesus monkey, which is more commonly known as the monkey with a green tail. And at that moment, my knees felt weak. The whole world came in and out at once. And my dad and I just sat there in silence. 30 years late, my Uncle Nick's gift had arrived. It was a gift that had killed millions of people. It was a gift that changed the way people loved and give and took blood. It was a gift that changed the dimensions of the Catholic Church. It was a gift that diminished and energized the gay community. It was a gift that showed us, revealed the deep secrets of humanity our needs, and the marginalized are part of every family, race, and class. It was a gift that changed the way of Africa, Asia, and the Americas, and Europe. It was a gift that took us from Mexico to the snowy banks of Boston, past the halls of the Holocaust, to Patrick's deathbed, to the warmth of Georgia, to Washington, DC. It was a gift that changed a Mexican man, his Danish wife, and his mixed children into an American family. And it was a gift that turned me into a playwright. I often wonder why I didn't become a doctor. And I'll tell you why. I had a front stage seat to change. My father was not part of the activists or scientists that helped come up with the, with the medicine. They were part of the people who helped change the culture, the indifference, the shame, so that other things could happen. They opened the door. They set a stage for dialogue. That is what public health is. And that is why I write plays. Colonization is about forcing the world to change to fit your needs. Evolution is about changing yourself to fit the needs of the world. And that is what I learned. And that's why I write plays. Theater is not about offering solutions but about setting a stage. It's about listening. And it's about really, at its core, about not being alone. When theater works, it's about community. And when it really works, it's about communion. Yesterday, the oldest member, the oldest, uh, uh, the man, the oldest person with HIV turned 100 years old. His name is Miguel, which is my grandfather's name. He lives in Portugal. He says the things that have allowed him to live this long is access to medicine, a glass of water with a lime rind every evening, and the fact that he feels valued, that he feels he's connected, and that he is not alone. Thank you.